Welcome to Intoxicated Masculine, where we talk about political culture, pop culture, drinking culture, sci-fi culture, and anything else that comes up. Joining me as always tonight is Brandon. Hello, my people. Jim. Hello, everybody. And Kale. All right. All right. Today, we're going to be a bunch of nerds and talk about reading and other dumb stuff like that. <laughs> uh, today, we're going to be covering our top five uh, favorite science fiction books. Uh, but before we talk sci-fi, let's talk drinking. Uh, Brandon, what do you have in the night? Uh, so I tried to, you know, there's, uh, different versions of like, uh, tonic, like gin and tonic, vodka tonic. I tried to make a bourbon tonic and it was terrible. Yeah. I so can that would not be good. I, I don't think those two flavors go together. I poured that out and then I just put bourbon and chinar in a glass. I don't Fair know what enough. that's called, but it's pretty good. It's a bourbon and chinar. <laughs> it's better than a bourbon and tonic i'll say that yes don't don't, don't drink i could have told you that right off the bat that those two things would not go well together i don't know know what chinar is what is it it's an amaro have you have you had campari yeah it's like campari but not quite as bitter as campari okay amaros have quite a range of flavor to them but they're always kind of bitter jim we actually did an episode about that mm -hmm. so what, what are you drinking tonight who? Me? You. Me? I'm having a, uh, whoa, a gin and tonic a with a little bit of orange juice in it because I ran out of lime. So I have Fair some enough. lime, just not enough. Fair enough. Kale, yeah, what are you having? I'm having Disaster at Mew Porter from Lion Bridge Brewing Company. It is a catalyst for conversation and community. It says so on there. Well, that it can't be perfect. lying because if that wasn't true, then they could go to jail. <laughs> Beer um, jail. The happiest jail on earth. Craft jail, so you have to wear flannel. And I'm drinking scotch because we're talking sci-fi. And in the future, people will drink scotch. Sure, we'll go with that. Um, okay, so uh, usually I start off with a brand. I'm going to start off with mine because I get to do whatever I want. Uh, we're going to name our five books. We'll do some honorable mentions uh, before we hit our number ones. Uh, but the first one I want to mention is kind of a, a controversial one. And I thought that we would kind of get this discussion out of the way first. Um, and it is Ender's Game by Orson Scott Card. Um, have you guys all read Ender's Game? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I love those books. I, I read the first two. I think I started number three before I sort of learned what I learned. Um, I think they're really interesting books, really well-written books. I like the characters a lot. Um, I think I, I maybe even like Speaker for the Dead better, um, but I just kind of figured Ender's Game is kind of a good, you know, you know, for the series, you know, talk about the first book. Um, but there is a problem that I think we'll probably get into, maybe do an episode about some, uh, do an episode about at some point. And that is sort of art versus artists. Like, can you enjoy the art of somebody who is kind of a, piece of human garbage which orson scott card is kind of a piece of human garbage um one of the most virulent anti-gay people uh that i know of um he's served on the board of anti-gay organizations uh he's come out uh anti-gay marriage he's supported making homosexuality illegal um he's he's just a, a real real bad guy um so as much as i love the book i have a hard time with it because how do you how do you sort of do that do that math in your head where i i like this fiction but i think the person who wrote it is awful so i don't know uh what, what do you guys think uh i have a hard time with that um honestly uh growing up i read a lot of robert heinland's books and enjoyed them a great deal and the older i got and more aware i was of the philosophy that he was trying to push through his books the more i thought wow did i really consume that how much of that did I internalize? Like, it definitely has affected my um, desire to go back and reread his books, for sure. Brandon, what do you think? Yeah, you, I, I think can you see were the that. One that. I think you were the one that got me into to uh, Ender's Game for the first time. The first time I read it. Yeah, that might be. Um, I don't know. It, it, well, and it it also is a question of time. Like, say we, you know, when we first read Ender's Game, the internet was barely a thing. 
And there probably wasn't a whole lot out about Orson Scott Card. We didn't really know anything about the author. We just read the books for the books themselves. I don't, I, I think, I think at some point, it's like participating in capitalism. At some point, you're going, you, you can find something wrong with probably most authors. And I don't know. I, I, I'm not I, saying I, that there isn't like some threshold. Like, yeah, Orson Scott Card's a bad guy, but he's the editor of uh, my uh, one honorable mention. Um, I don't know. At some point, though, there's like, like when, when is the cutoff, I guess, is the real question. Like, I'm probably not going to recommend Mein Kampf, but that's not like a like a great story anyway. I I don't know. There's got to be, be some axis. Well, there's probably some graph, you know, where it passes beyond the author being horrible and the book being good enough to read or whatever. I mean, I guess like a lot of H.P. Uh, Lovecraft is pretty anti-Semitic and stuff. Oh, H.P. Right? Lovecraft is one of the most racist people that I've ever read in my life. It is through, yeah. throughout his whole book. It is like virulently racist uh it's kind of shocking when you start to read his books and you're like wow he really really didn't like black people very much yeah yeah and that i and a lot of good there like a, there's, there's been a, a there's a difference with with uh hp lovecraft though because i can buy an hp lovecraft knowing uh that i'm not giving any money to hp lovecraft because he's dead yeah yeah there's there's something to be said about that too what about jk Rowling? yeah got she's a real problem I'll tell you what, let's let's kind of again, I kind of wanted to bring this up just a little bit because I think we could probably do a whole episode on this. There's a whole bunch of names, you know, uh, Frank Miller is another person that's kind of like that. Uh, I know there are certain people that very much don't like uh, um, Alan Moore. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of artists. Out, I mean, I talk more about comic book artists because it's kind of what I know. But, you know, a lot of artists out there. I mean, Roman Polanski would be another, you know, big one to talk about in that category. Like, you know, do I want to watch Rosemary's Baby because it's one of the most important horror movies ever made? But also Roman Polanski is one of the worst people in in movie making. Um, and I think it's kind of an open question. I, I don't want to get into it too deep because, again, I think we could talk about that pretty extensively as a, as a, as a single topic. But that'd be interesting. You, I wouldn't mind doing some research on it. Do you guys have any final thoughts on on or Scott Card or Ender's Game? It's funny. I realized I didn't really talk about the book. That, I mean, the book is great. You know, it's it's, it's just a, it's a neat little story. And it, it's also one of those books you have to be kind of careful. Not, you know, if you're going to go read it. Um, it's easy to spoil it because the ending is kind of a, a little twist ending um, and it's a really cool twist ending that I liked a lot. And I don't know, it's just, a, it's a very sort of fun adventure kind of book with has very kind of uh, relatable characters. And I, I just really like that book a lot. And I, like I said, I think I like speaker for the dead, maybe even more. What was the year it came out? Oh, I didn't look. Cause it kind of, I wonder how much it has influenced like shonen style anime to um 1985 or, or uh harry potter for that matter oh yeah i could definitely see some parallels with harry potter on that definitely and maybe those two would have more to discuss now than we would like them to jim yeah. i don't know what I'll, I'll bet you orson scott card isn't just so happens to be great on you know trans rights well yeah i can imagine not all right jim what did you think andrew's game um I liked it. I didn't think it was one of the best things I'd ever read. Um, also, I feel like by the time I read it, I already knew a little bit that I didn't care for Orson Scott Card. Um, yeah, the first time I read it, I had no idea. I didn't learn about him until, I mean, not really until like the 2010s, I think, or something like that. I, that, that range anyway. But, I don't know, Kill, do you have anything to say about Ender's Game? Um, it is on my list. Um, and I just want to pull the curtain back here for the for the people watching that I'm not a huge reader specific, of any specific genre at all. Uh, so my list is very much slapped together. And so the uh, the reason that I have most of these on my list is because I've either seen a, a movie version of it of some sort or. Uh, just like I've heard about it from other people. I've well, never, that's you, good. I mean, we're just trying to pass on our favorite stories on to other people. So, did you see the movie? You know I'm not sure. I've seen Ender's. I don't think I ever saw the movie. I know it's got Harrison Ford. 
because I thought when well, I'll get when I when it comes up on my list, I'll talk about the reason that I wanted to talk about it. Fair enough. Uh, all right, uh, Brandon. I didn't you know plan? about all the. Sorry. No, go ahead. I didn't know about all the, the drama behind a lot of these artists and stuff. Like I, I don't really get into that stuff. Um, but once I mean someone says, "Hey, you should look into this," then yeah, I will. Yeah, it's a uh, disappointing, uh, especially when it's a book you really like. Um, yeah, Never I, I really either. feel sorry for like. I mean, imagine you're a transgender person who grew up loving Harry Potter and how much that has got a sting. Yeah, how much that sucks. All right. Anyway, Brandon, now that I have uh, gotten our initial uh, um, controversy out of the way, what is your number five? You want five, or you want an honorable mention? Let's wait. Hold the honorable mentions till right before number one. That way, if somebody else has one of your honorable mentions on the list, you can kind of talk about it then. Okay. Um, my number five is How to Live Safely in a Science Fictional Universe by Charles Yu. Um, I, I don't really even know how to describe it. Um, he can... In the future, they have figured out kind of like parallel universe traveling and time traveling at the same time. So sometimes he will go to a universe and then come back and because of consequences, that universe will no longer exist. So he's now got memories and this from a, a place that isn't. I, I don't know. It, it's it's a very interesting book as far as just um, the concepts in it. It's also a fun read. I had my mom read it too, and she thought it was fun too. But it takes you some time to just kind of sit there and go, am I understanding this? Because I, I think Charles Yu is probably way smarter than I am. But I don't know. It was really good. I, I think it's one I would really like other people to read. So is it like uh, like narrative then, or is it more like a, cause like, I think of that almost sounds like you remember reading uh, world war Z where it's kind of written more like, uh, a, like I a think history. I did the audiobook on world war Z, but I think the audiobook on world war Z is the way to do it. Cause that's such a great cast. Yeah. If the movie sucked. Um, I don't know. I, I haven't read that one, but so it's like a narrative then. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a, it's following a, a guy as he, as he goes through the, it's basically about him doing his job, which is kind of, um, uh, a, oh yeah, right. He's a time machine mechanic. So it kind of screws things up for him. Cause you know, there's times where he'll spend, um, uh, well, uh, I'm reading off the Wikipedia just for quick synopsis. Uh, he spend travels through the minor universe 31 fixing time machines of people who try to fix the past. Um, uh, I don't know. It, it's really good. And it's hard to describe, especially if you're trying not to give anything away. Fair enough. Jim? Uh, my first one is Earth Clan by David Brin. It's kind of a cheat. It's two books, but often it's sold in a single, single volume. Um, it's uh, the first book was written in 1983. The second one is 1987. The individual books are Star Tide Rising and The Uplift War. And um, kind of the setup for the book is uh, it's 100 years in the future, 200 years, 300 years in the future, sometime in the future. And we find out we, we've started reaching out into the stars, colonizing other planets. And we find out we're not alone. We're part of a galactic civilization. Well, galactic, this galactic civilization is all based on an economy of uplifting other species to sentience. And That's kind of cool. um, humans have done that. They've uplifted dolphins and chimpanzees. And it's a good thing we did, because if we didn't, when we got found, somebody would have claimed us. Uh, they would have said, look at these primitives. They need some guidance. But because Earth had gone ahead uh, and uplifted dolphins and chimpanzees, we had a lot better standing in galactic civilization. So um, some of the background drama is 
there's a lot of people that don't like that uh, we're not conforming to the typical galactic civilization. Everybody else has been uplifted. No one is, uh, has done it on their own. So there's a huge portion of the galactic civilization that thinks it, Earthlings are a scam. Somebody uplifted us and then they forgot about us because we're worthless. Um, so that's kind of the background of the two books. The first book is a ship crewed mostly with dolphins. And they're, you know, kind of on a Star Trek expedition, just exploring space. And I feel like that could rock. be a reference to another sci-fi property. <laughs> um, they uh, run into a derelict right. ship in the middle of nowhere. And it turns out it's ancient, super, super, super ancient. And it potentially belonged to a race known as pro progenitors that were kind of one of the, the first founding races of this galactic civilization. And um, once some of the communications get intercepted, all of a sudden it's a, uh, it's, it's a chase book. There's all sorts of people after the dolphins, they have to go hide, et cetera. Um, that, that book I think is just fun. Uh, it's not, uh, it doesn't really, um, it doesn't make you think as much as the second one. The second one is the uplift war and um, it follows the events of the first book. And it's set on a colony planet, mostly manned by humans and chimps. And um, one of the other galactic civilizations decides that they really wanna know what this dolphin ship found. And so they decide that they're gonna invade the planet. And they take down all the humans because the humans are the most important and they don't worry too much about the chimpanzees because they've only been uplifted for a hundred years. So who cares? And the chimpanzees, stage A, you got it, guerrilla warfare. So, um, and it kind of, uh, the book ends on a practical joke, essentially. Um, and uh, I, can't, I can't give away the, uh, the details because like Brandon said, it would spoil the book. But uh, it's, it's got a pretty good, pretty good twist ending. So, um, also, if you like David Bren, another uh, suggestion is The Postman. It doesn't have anything to do with Uplift. It's uh, um, set in the post-apocalyptic post world, and it's way set, better. It's set in the Costner reverse. No, it's <laughs> not. That's awful, awful, awful movie. Does he deliver mail with a boat where the world's covered in water? <laughs> you know yep. what? I kind of like Waterworld, even though I know it's bad. I still kind of like it. Yeah, it's so ridiculous. Um, I did want to ask one thing about uh, about that book. Is there any point in the book uh, where the dolphins say goodbye and perhaps show their appreciation for a certain type of food? I don't think so. <laughs> no, uh, that's we, a good might, segue into mine. <laughs> we might get back to that. Um, no, that sounds good. Uh, Kale, what, what's, what's your first one? Uh, well, my number five be just became uh, a uh, honorable mention because I thought of something that I didn't real. Did, I just, you know, I was like, wow, how did I not already think of this? And not just because of what Jim was just talking about. I wrote this down before he started talking, just to clarify. <laughs> um, but back in high school, there was a very popular book called The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And For the record, I'll be talking more about that one in a little while. A handful of my friends all read it, uh, and and I I've seen the movie, and it's a really great uh, introduction to sci-fi because it's very humorous. Uh, it's kind of like what Evil Dead is to horror. That's what Hitchhiker's Guide is to sci-fi, like. You're out in this like just huge uh, galaxy. Your your uh, your horizons of of what you think you know just expand exponentially, 
uh, all these different uh, races and, and all these different uh, just incredible technologies and stuff. But it's set in such a way that it's almost slapstick. Like it's it makes it very human and very relatable. Um, the the juicer helmet is hilarious on the in the in the planet where uh, the bureau all the bureaucrats come from where if you have an individual thought it slaps you in the face just just great it is a great movie great movie great book one of my favorite robots in a series of all times we got marvin all i have to say about it is i love that series and i will have more things to say about that series the uh increasingly inappropriately titled trilogy was that the first book or was the the diner it's a it's a so it's a hitchhiker's get to the galaxy restaurant at the end of the universe uh then uh uh life the universe and everything then so long and thanks for all the fish then mostly harmless i think is that right i think mostly harmless is the last one yeah i'm pretty sure that's i know so long and thanks for all the fish is the fourth so life the universe and everything must be the third one yeah, it's it's really good. I it's one of those ones I again recommended to my mom. I happen to have a copy to add all five books all in one. So I gave her that one. You've really seen people kind it. of increasingly are just buying that as one sort of because each book is pretty short. I think each yeah. book's only like what maybe 200 pages or something like that at the most. I don't know, Jim, do you would you listen or listen to? I did listen to that book too, but did you did you, you listen to Vogon Poetry? So <laughs> I uh I do think I listened to it and I think I just listened to the first book. Um, I liked it. I thought it was entertaining. It's not uh, not really my uh, cup of tea, I guess, but uh, I can see why people really like it. Oh, it's my jam. Um, it's not my jam for my number four, though, because my number four is a different book because that book shows that I, you know, am uh, re- reading my elevated sci-fi, whatever the hell that means. Uh, it's my number four is A Brave New World. Um, it's Aldous Huxley. Uh, I don't know. I like the kind of more, I guess you'd call it maybe like ponderous sci-fi. Um, it's about stuff. Uh, and it is, you know, it's, it's interesting. And I, there, there's so many kind of memorable quotes from it. And it's, it's very kind of, it's like, everything seems like it's really great, but it's not um, because everybody's kind of broken. Um, and I don't know, it sort of talks, I think it's talking a lot about how, um, some of this technology is fine and all this stuff is fine, but sort of maintaining connection with people and maintaining a connection with the earth is really important and maintaining a connection with, you know, with our humanity and not getting too disconnected, which I think in this day and age is probably something a lot of people should hear because I think we're increasingly disconnected. Um, And I think in, in not to make this political, because, you know, Lord knows we don't like to talk about politics here. Um, But I think that the disconnected nature makes us easier to control and easier to, you know, fracture, uh, any kind of movements because we're all sort of just, you know, all doing our soma and and orgy porgy fording and funning it. <laughs> um, I think Brave New World is much more likely than 1984. Oh yeah, oh yeah. As, I mean, I think it's one of those things. Like in in 1984, which is a book that could have gone on here very easily. Um, honestly, I didn't think about it, but I'm kind of glad I put uh, Brave New World on there, even though I think I probably like. Uh, 1984 better as a book um yeah the idea of a populace that is just being controlled through just kind of pleasure so they're always just kind of happy um and dumb and easily controlled and just you know nothing to fight against nothing to rise up against no no thing to point to and say this is the great big bad that is doing us wrong and all that a very comfortable blanket and handcuffs Jim, did you read a Brave New World? Uh, it's been a long time. It seemed like I kind of liked it. Like you said, I, I preferred 1984, but um, it might be I more th- I think I did. Too. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I, and I didn't really think about that until Brandon mentioned that, but it, it sounds to me like, yeah, I do, I do think that the 1984, you know, uh, um, is, is a great book. <laughs> um, I like that. And Animal, Far- Animal Farmer, both, uh, both great. But I, I do think... Yeah, I, th- I think that uh, that Brave New World has a certain kind of resonance in, in our culture today because we are all kind of um, uh, anesthetized in our own little bubbles of, of you know, 
farts or whatever we have, you know, surrounding us, telling us that everything's fine and we don't need to do anything. Uh, Kale, did you know anything about Brave New World? I don't know. It's, it's kind of like, I don't know. It, I think it's one of those books that everybody talks about and most people haven't even read. If it's like 1984 or something like that, then I get the concept. It's weird. It's like 1984, uh, but almost kind of the opposite. Kind of the similar like I concept. Saying, but... I mean, isn't, uh, isn't our our real life goal to get beyond conflict, to, to get to a point to where all the people come together and and you know everything like is happy <laughs> but this is used more as a means of control it's uh yeah 1984 is much closer to um uh, handmaid's tale in that it becomes very rigid and stifling and gives people something that they can point to it's no i mean conspiracy theories are much more dangerous to a democracy than Jack booted thugs because those things can be overcome. Conspiracy theories warp the mind; they warp reality. Um, and the soma drug in Brave New World does kind of that same thing. It doesn't give people; it robs them of even the chance to point at something and say that's the wrong. Yeah, uh, when also very much the the Matrix, I think, is kind of a takeoff on that too. Um, did any of you guys read the Neuromancer? I've never read that one. The the one that like Gibson. Yeah, the so. one that The Matrix is kind of sort of based on. Yes, I love it. It did, yeah. not, it make, it did not make my list, but um, mostly because I tried to choose authors that I had multiple books of theirs that I liked. And right. William Gibson, I feel like I've never really been able to get into any of his other books, but I it's highly... One-hit wonder. <laughs> not really. I, I just I haven't cared for his other stuff. So I sometimes get uh, Neuromancer confused with, like... There's three books, Neuromancer, Cryptonomicon, and Snow Crash that I always get kind of confused on their plot lines. But um, So Snow Crash and uh, Neuromancer are the ones that are really close. Cryptonomicon is, um, I will be talking about that in a little bit. Okay. It's, it's, uh, it's not, not the same. Okay. Um, it's, like, it, it's not cyberpunk. I think that, uh, uh, again, I think Brave New World is one of those books that it is sort of talked about more than it is actually read but you should read it because it's good it's not even it's not even a very long book uh, i don't think it's a particularly challenging book it's just kind of i don't know kind of different I, I enjoyed it a lot well it's been years so i read it unfortunately but, uh brandon what is your numero uh quattro well i mean i almost left it off just because we've talked about it so much but it kind of has to be there it's dune uh from 1965 um I mean, we've done episode after episode about it, so I, I don't need to rehash it a whole bunch, but Dune is definitely not only a fantastic book that spawned a lot of other books and TV shows and movies. It also is, I mean, you can see its influence in modern sci-fi, modern fantasy. I mean, you can see its influence in uh, uh, The Wheel of Time. You can see its influence in uh, Game of Thrones, even. I mean there's there's a lot there yeah i would say more about it but we talked about it for seven hours so. yeah <laughs> i've literally said everything about dune that i could ever well, possibly it's, say that's why i almost left it off but it's really not fair it deserves a spot in the top five but right. so i appreciate you doing that uh i left it off my list because we talked about it yeah forever otherwise yeah, it, would be, it would be my number one book uh as far as it's in older, my honorable mentions. I just want as to far as that. older science fiction, I feel like it's the best, if one of the best, if not the best, and it really holds up over time. I feel like a lot of Asimov and Heinlein, if you go back and read them, you'll be like, oh my gosh, this is not science fiction. This is right. I mean, we're decades past where they were. But, we might have a disagreement later on. But uh <laughs> but what's happening in Dune, like it's completely different because they're they've set up a society where they are outlawing thinking machines. So it's a pretty interesting setup for the book. Sounds good. Gail? Right. Do you have anything new to say about Dune? <laughs> yeah, that's Is that even too. possible. 
Is it it's on, on my list. We'll talk about it later. <laughs> I won't have anything new to say about it then. So just talk. Well, that's fine. Um, all right, uh, Jim, what's your, what's your number four? Uh, so Brandon just brought it up. It's a 1999 book by Neil Stevenson, Cryptonomicon. Um, it is, it's not super science fiction-y if you read it now, but when it came out in 1999, uh, you know, it's set in the near future, but the main cast of characters are trying to raise money through a small business to set up a data haven off the shore of the Philippines to um, create a cryptocurrency. And the money that they're going to make off the cryptocurrency, they're going to use it to fund training defensive war warfare tactics to people that are suffering from genocide. Um, so not political or anything. Right. So that's, that's the main present day storyline. At the same time, there's a storyline going on in World War II with stolen Nazi gold and Japanese trying to hide it in the Philippines. And the two, two storylines kind of converge at the end. And uh, I, I just think it's a, it, I will say it is a long book, um, but I think it's, <laughs> it's, a big I think it's very, very rewarding. Um, the World War II stuff, I think, is just fascinating because it really talks a lot about um, uh, the efforts to decrypt um, Nazi messages. And uh, it's just because it's the, the dawn of the computer age. Um, so I, I found that really, really fascinating. It's, it's kind of like half historical fiction, half uh, speculative science fiction. Now, I have tried a Stevenson book uh, before. Is he is he like uh, David Foster Wallace, Thomas Pension? You know these guys that are just an overabundance of detail about every little thing. Is he like that? Yes. So That's, I will yeah, say, I if that. you're if you're going to do it, you've got to kind of commit to getting over the hump a few times in some of these books. I think. If you wanted one of his books that is an easier read, it's Snow Crash. It's compared to his other books, it's very fast paced moving. Um, it is, some of it's really off the wall. But, I just uh, picked uh, up Snow Crash. I found it on sale on Kindle. So. Yeah, my, uh, <clears throat> my son Nolan just started reading it and he is in love with the main character, hero, protagonist, um, who's a pizza delivery man and takes it very seriously. So um, my other recommendation for Neil Stevenson is uh, Diamond Age. And um, that's, uh, that's set in uh, far-flung future in China. And it's all very much about um, 3D printing technology being used for society and um, uh, still some cyberpunk elements to it. Uh, I think it's, it's uh, the... the the main character is of has very little means and um, gets involved in a social experiment to see whether rich kids and poor kids can uh, achieve the same same level of success. So it's a, hmm. I think it's a pretty interesting one. But so this if one's if called you... Cryptonom. Yeah, Cryptonomicon is my main recommendation. So if you like it, does that make you a crypto bro? I think so. <laughs> Guilty. I, I have to admit. It does sound I, interesting. I'm, I will actually look into that. And I'm not even like a big reader. I, I've uh, I bought a little bit of crypto here and there because, you know, I'm a white guy in my early 40s. Of course, I bought crypto because it's like a requirement, I think. Um, I, I still have no idea what it is or how it works. Um, but since I bought it, it's worth more than when I than when I bought it. So I guess that's all i know about crypto and it's on the blockchain which i say that i don't have a clue what a blockchain is <laughs> but, but i just say like all kinds of words i'm just trying to You're imagine like, talking about like what's crypto oh it's on the blockchain you know it's on the it's on the blockchain yeah i know buzzwords yeah. i know what i'm talking about what does it mean that it's on the blockchain well if it's on the blockchain that means it's crypto so that's how it works Let's see 
It's very complicated. I can't explain it to you, unfortunately. It sounds like, it sounds like this, this terrible sales tactic that people used all through the 80s and 90s where they just used words that nobody knew to make it sound like it was some big thing that they knew. Corinthian all leather. You're just supposed to trust them. Like, bro, just trust me. I'm going to make you rich. Genuine trademark leather. It's not leather. It's a trademark called genuine. They can call something. It's not leather. Oh, we could talk about sales forever. Um, yeah, that sounds good. Uh, Kale, what is your number four? My number four is Shadow and Bone. Um, I watched, I binged the entire series on Netflix in one day. Um, and it turns out it's just the first book of a trilogy. Um, it's pretty good. From, I haven't read it, from, but the show is good. From what I understand of it, it's about this uh, girl who comes from very, uh, very much, very little means at all, uh, orphaned. Uh, turns out she has this power. They live in a world, and this is this is also another thing too, because we're talking about sci-fi, and I think this definitely falls under the category of fantasy. And a lot of people slap sci-fi and fantasy together. And I, I understand it's an issue of debate for some people. I don't know if you guys want to talk about that or not. But um, back to the, the story, uh, Shadow and Bone is the first book of three books. And uh, it's about this girl. Uh, she becomes what they call the Sun Summoner. And uh, she can basically uh, cast this radiant light. All, all these different... Uh, what are they call they're called the the Grecians. Uh, they all have they're like mages basically. Uh, some can control wind. Uh, some can control fire. So really, they're more like benders, like uh, not bender from Futurama, but benders like airbenders. We were but, following you. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, this girl just like. She just comes out of nowhere, and then uh, this guy takes her under his wing, you know, tries to show her how to use her powers better, and turns out he's a real jerk, and uh, he's the reason there's this big shadowy void in the world, and uh, he basically uh, betrays her and tries to steal her power for himself, um, and I'm not going to ruin it, but yeah, there's like a battle, and then... Apparently, there's a lot more because in the series, it looks like, you know, it's like, okay, they, the good guys have won, but that's not necessarily the case, and it goes on. And I hope they continue the series on Netflix because that way I won't have to read it. <laughs> anyway. I, haven't, I haven't heard of it myself, but it seems to have gotten very good reception. So um, if any of the reception on Netflix, it's going to get picked up for a second season. It has, it has a lot of different elements. It has almost kind of a steampunky element to it. They have like yeah. uh, land ships where they kind of go across the sands. Uh, and like, and it's kind of that Western motif where like, it's like this small town kind of, kind of Western style town where it's got like gambling halls and, and, and booze halls and stuff like that. And uh but then, then there's a lot of subplot. There's a, there's a lot of uh, dirty dealings going on between some of the characters. There's a, it's, some it's anti really anti heroes. Yeah. Or, uh, Just to let you know, Kale, and you'll be happy to know it was renewed for a second season. Oh, it was. That's good. So I I have not read the book. I saw the show. I thought the show was all right. Um, I imagine. I think it it seems like an interesting setup, and I. I will say, for one, I have no problem with uh, conflating sci-fi and fantasy. I feel like the entire purpose behind them is to address concerns now, but do it in a fictional way so that people, it makes it easier to digest because you're not bringing all the baggage with it. Well, I was going to, uh, just a brief little digression, because uh, the, the four of us were had a conversation the other day. Uh, where we were talking about Westerns and sort of the definition of Westerns. Uh, and I thought it was kind of interesting because Brandon and I think disagree a little bit on the definition of a Western. Uh, and so now we're going to punch each other in the face. <laughs> no, um, I like, so I, I think it's interesting 
because when it comes to sci-fi and fantasy, I do kind of see a definitional difference. And I'm the one who is on the side of like no definitions or anything. Um, and the, the thing that I, and there's obviously a lot of things that'll sort of skirt the line between being science fiction and being fantasy. You know, I get that. Um, but I feel like science fiction more often tackles social issues um, and fantasy less often tackles social issues. And, you I know, think that's accurate. Brandon, can you think of a, of, a sci- of, of a fantasy either show or, or uh, you know, book that, that is sort of specifically tackling some kind of social issue? Well, I mean, there's a lot of social issues in the Wheel of Time series. Okay. Um, also, uh, Lord of the Rings is basically a response to World War II, World War One, the horrors of war. Yeah, I, I, though I think I would agree that science fiction does do it more often, especially science fiction short, short stories. Yeah. I agree with that. Um, all right, well, I'll go on to my... Go ahead. Between the two genres, like you guys brought up Game of Thrones earlier. I would never consider that sci-fi. Yeah, I would yeah. definitely consider it fantasy. Yeah. Um, so oh, I'm going to go on to my number three. It does do some ahead. political issues. Sorry. Oh yeah, Game of Thrones gets a little political, um, and then in the show it just gets bad. Um, God, that was a shitty ending. Oof. Anyway, moving right along. So my number three, um, it, I knew I was going to include this author because he's great, no matter what Jim says. Um, and I think probably the greatest, probably the greatest, just straight sci-fi author. Because my next two authors are not what I would call straight sci-fi authors. The the, the books that I'm going to talk about are sci-fi books, but um, this guy is just, he's a, I mean, and he's written other stuff too, but he's like a straight sci-fi and that's of course, Isaac Asimov. Um, and I, I was, I kind of wanted to do the robot series because I like the robot series a lot. And I think it's kind of underrated, um, for what it is because it's weird. It's, it's a sci-fi mystery. All three of the books are sci-fi mysteries. Um, and I think it's interesting. Plus the way he talks about, you know, getting people, the psychology of the spacers versus the people that live, uh, still on earth is really, really interesting. And, the way they see the world differently or see the worlds differently. Um, but ultimately I had to go with my favorite, which is foundation. Um, and I'll use the first one just because it's kind of a stand in for the foundation series, which I've read three of the books. Um, I'm kind of, I'm kind of started going back through the Asimov chronological, which is you read, you know, the, uh, um, the robot series, the empire series, and then you read all the foundations and, the the chronological order is kind of messed up because some of the books are prequels and it's it's kind of confusing but uh no i think the foundation is great it's really interesting i like the idea of psychohistory uh psychohistory is actually kind of a real thing it doesn't mean the same thing it does in the books um it, it's more studying the psychology of historical figures um which i think both of those things are interesting um but the idea of setting up a foundation which is just sort of uh you know there to maintain uh, the knowledge of civilization so that when, you know, all these wars and fiefdoms and all these other things have finally settled out, the knowledge of humanity is still there. It's sort of like this uh, library of Alexandria or something like that. You know, the, um, it, I think it's, I, I see a lot of parallels with the middle eight, you know, the fall of the Roman empire, which imagine that the fall of the galactic empire, you know, leads into uh, a metaphor for, you know, the middle ages. Um, and it's just really interesting how the people in the foundation have to constantly find ways to, you um, in many cases, they are the less powerful uh, element in the story, uh, and they're sort of being faced off against by more powerful people in ways in which they, you know, use their minds to sort of overcome those those hurdles. And it's just it's really cool, uh, especially the way in which they use religion. I think these it's in the I can't remember this in the first book or the second book where they get into the whole religion thing. I think it's maybe towards the end of the first book, but I can't remember for sure. Brandon, do you remember? I think it's in the first one. OK, I think it is, too. Um, the way they use religion as, as kind of a tool, which is, you know, I think that is sort of a show a, a parallel with the Catholic Church. Um, and it's just I don't know, it's it's a really, really great book and a lot of fun. And and, and if you like it, there's a lot more to read. <laughs> so I have a question for you. Uh, have you tried to reread the robot mystery books like Caves of Steel? Yeah, I've read all of them. I love them. Um, how does it compare on the reread? Well, I didn't read I them all that like long I, ago. I feel like I love Foundation the first time I read it. And then when I went back to reread it, I found it hard to get through. Um, 
Okay, so the, the, the thing with the robot trilogy, you have to go into it understanding that it is not a traditional science fiction book. Um, it is I, very I, definitely a murder mystery that is set in a, in a future time frame. Um, and I think once you've sort of got yourself into that headspace, then it's great. Um, but I mean, if you're expecting, you know, people jumping around shooting laser beams at each other, you're going to be very disappointed because there's not I'm any not of sure that. that's Jim's complaint, though. No. I, so I actually preferred the uh, the robot series to the Foundation, at least the early Foundation books. I, I kind of like the later Foundation books quite a bit. Well, I haven't got back to it. So there's, there's a weird thing. I, I do typically all of my reading I do on audio. Um, and Robots and Empire has, and I think we might have talked about this before, um, Robots and Empire has been like the bane of my existence because it's, there's no audio version of it, except I found now there is one on YouTube. So I'll finally get through Robots and Empire and get into the, the Empire trilogy, and then I'll get into the, to the uh, foundation after that. So I can't tell you for sure, but I, I, again, I'm just right now actually rereading. I, I read uh, Caves of Steel, and I think the second one is The Naked Sun. Um, and I really like both of those. I think they're really good. And I remember liking the last one too. Um, so, but, but Foundation, I don't know. I feel like it just has more, like it's more sci-fi of a book than the Robots trilogies are. Yeah. Um, I can't tell you which way. It's been so long since I've read The Foundation that I don't want to tell you for sure that I like it better than the Robots books. Um, iRobot, I think, is actually a lot of fun. It's kind of a, um, iRobot is not really a novel. It's sort of a collection of short stories, except sort of disguised as a, as a narrative book, um, yeah. where there's a doctor that's retiring from the robot institute and she's like telling these stories about robots from the past so it's like it's clearly not one narrative book it's like short stories but kind of stitched together into one book and i think a lot of the stories in that are really really good um really good short stories um i think another good one would be you know our favorite sci-fi short stories because you know there's some great there's some authors that even if i don't love their books i love their short stories a lot um and uh yeah, the short stories and I robot are great. So I don't know. I'll have to remain unanswered as to whether or not definitively I like the robots better than foundation, but uh, I remember liking the foundation a heck of a lot and just the ideas behind it. Has any, have you guys watched the, the TV show? I have. Is it good? Is it the same? Um, I would say like I loved half of it and hated <laughs> half of it. Not hated, but Very I feel like the, shows. I don't know if it was two different production crews or what, but the stuff that's set on the home planet, I thought was exceptionally well done. And the stuff that's done on the foundation world looked like a sci-fi channel movie. Like, Brennan, what do you think of foundation? Well, I'll save a little time. It's also my number three. Um, well, there you go. <laughs> but I, I do, I do think, cause I have recently reread it. <laughs> And I think it is at the place it is for me because it made me think of things in a different way and it got me started on sci-fi. That being said, looking back at it, it's uh, dialogue is pretty dated. The characters are not overly developed. Like they, they seem very stock and, I don't know. It's it's not quite as good as I remember it, but for what it is and for what it it led me down, what path it led me down as being a, both a sci fi and a fantasy uh, reader. It, it deserves its spot up there, but I was surprised that I didn't like it quite as much as I did the first time. Fair enough. I don't know. I'll. I'll... I'll come back once I've gotten back to him again. Uh, I remember liking him a lot. And I do, do you have you guys read the Empire books like the stars, the stars like dust and, and all those? No, I've, uh, I've, I've, I've heard that's kind of the weak point of the of the whole Asimov chronology. So I feel like when I read them, I didn't realize that they were like part of a chronology. So I, re I read them all completely out of order. Mm -hmm. Well, I think I don't even know if they were originally meant to be a chronology or if he kind of uh, came up with that later on, because um, they were all kind of written in a weird order. He didn't write them like all right. in the same order, uh, like Robots and Empire, which which takes place. Robots and Empire is sort of the bridge book between um, the the robots. Well, obviously, the robot series and the Empire series. Um, and that was written way later on. I think that was written in like the 1980s or maybe 1990s or something like that. Um but I, I don't know. That book quite a bit. I'm looking forward to it. I think I it's personally, uh, 
Go ahead, Kim. I was, I was just going to add into this. I, I don't have as much to say about the books as you guys do, but um, I've, I've seen bits about Isaac Asimov himself, and he's an interesting guy. Um, I would I would be interested in learning more about him as a person and his uh, philosophies on life. Um, I yeah, I was I think you definitely would of iRobot and um, I you made me think of something uh, when you because you kept uh, saying that it was a mystery it was a mystery you know and I and I was saying okay he's a detective trying to solve the mystery but the the interesting part to me was it never really dawned on me until this point that um, it's really a battle between two AIs there's one AI that thinks one thing and another AI that thinks another thing and they're actually battling each other too not necessarily directly but one of them clearly wants to help humanity whereas the other one wants to control it the interesting thing about irobot the book or the, the movie is it's kind of weird because it's kind of sort of a little bit like the caves of steel um but it's also takes i think it's kind of a weird amalgamation of some of the asimov stories where they kind of pick and choose some of the things and combine it into its own narrative um okay. I think I think I didn't like iRobot, but also I, I went into iRobot having read all the robot books. And so if you do that, you're definitely not getting you're you're kind of getting almost a weird shortened version of those kind of Frankenstein together a little bit, which if you haven't read those books and you don't go into with those preconceived notions, then you you're probably not bothered by any of that stuff because you're just watching it like a movie uh, and I'm watching it like an asshole. <laughs> Um, all right, Brent, do you have anything final to say on foundation? No, no, I, it's definitely worth reading the first time anyway. Oh yeah. Definitely. Regardless if it holds up on a reread, I, I think it's, it's worth reading in the first place. It's worth reading some of Asimov's books, regardless. There's one of my favorite stories is where the, uh, the, was it like three or five construction robots go to Jupiter and like, they're just trying to explore the planet and get some answers, but the Jupiter people keep attacking them and like bombing them and nothing works because they're like worker robots. So they're designed to take a whole bunch of punishment. And eventually the, the Jupiter people just decide they're like gods and conquerors, even though they're just interested in scouting. I, I think that was great. And their stilted dated language kind of works because it's a robot, you know, I don't know. It's he's worth getting into at least. Yeah, I love I love Asimov. Uh, and I, I might have mentioned it on a previous episode. I can't remember in my uh, philosophy one on one class. Uh, an Asimov essay is what opened the textbook. So interesting fellow. Uh, Jim, what is your number three? Uh, my number three is a 2005 uh, book by Charles Strauss called Acceler Accelerando. Accelerando. I don't know how to say that. Um, so it's uh, it's set in the. Uh, far future on earth and um artificial intelligence is reaching the singularity which is the point at which artificial intelligence becomes uh, more intelligence than human intelligence um that and, doesn't take a lot of intelligence to be honest right <laughs> uh <clears throat> it's a very fast-paced economy there's a lot of uh social issues going on so uh, humans are having a hard time competing against artificial intelligence companies, having a hard time keeping up. Um, also, there's a lot of uh, machines that are augmented with uh, humans and humans that are augmented with machines. Um, and it's, uh, it's set in three different time periods, uh, three different uh, descendants. And um, so the... The descendant at the start is uh, kind of somebody that plays fast and loose with the rules and is trying to cut corners and um, is finding the economy harder and harder and harder to compete with. Um, the characters that are later in the, the later portions of the book are dealing with um, the artificial intelligence in the solar system starting to use the solar system to make one gigantic ring and uh 
and the consequence of that not being a unique event in the universe that uh, maybe we aren't meant to stay around for very long. Um, so it's a it's it's a little a little intense. Um, I really like the multiple storylines. Um, there's a great twist in the book. There's a character that's very key to um, the conclusion that you just did not realize was uh, such a prime mover in the book. So I have a question about that. And this is sort of a, a narrative thing that I have a problem with and I love, like depending on how they do it. Um, when somebody does something that just completely out of the, like knocks your, like, you're like, oh my God, I didn't see that coming. And my mind immediately asked me t- one question. Could I have seen that coming? If the answer is yes, then I love it. If the answer is no, then I hate it. It's like, uh, so I've recently went through, and this is going to be com- a little off topic, but I'll, I'll bring it back. I promise. Um, I recently did a wa- rewatch through of all the Scream movies, uh, which I think the Scream movies are actually genuinely pretty good movies. At least the first couple are. Third one's kind of bad. The fourth one's real bad. And then I just watched the fifth one, which is, uh, spoiler, bad. Um, the third one, um, the killer's just some guy who it's like is a spoiler for screen three. It's like a uh, Sydney's half brother with somebody that her mom had when she was in Hollywood 25 years ago. And like, they come up with that and you're like, no, screw you, screw you for that ending. Like there's no way anybody could have known that there's no clues about it in the movie. It's ridiculous. And so that kind of thing pisses me off. But then again, there's other endings where like they were planting those seeds throughout the whole thing. And like, if you went back and reread it or rewatched the movie, you're like, oh my God, they were doing this whole thing that I just didn't see at the time. And so how, how do, do they do that to their, like, could you, if you were to reread that book, would you pick up on it? I think you, you definitely would see clues. Okay. Um, I will also say that I am not somebody, I don't read critically that kind of stuff i just read to enjoy I do everything I a, critically I have, a, I have a friend who has a very similar taste in books and since we were like 10 he'd be like you you didn't see that coming no i didn't see that coming so anyway that's just that's just me friend have you read that one no no i haven't i mean yeah. i've wrote i wrote i wrote it down it sounds good but no i haven't read it um so as a, uh, another suggestion for this author, completely um, different vein is Atrocity Archives and it's um, a Lovecraftian uh, X-Files comedic um, secret agency that uh, is trying to keep everybody safe from scary, scary things. And uh, what they, they all work- Many in angled both. ones yeah they all work in cubicles and it's just their day job they're just trying to get a check and trying to make make it you know monday through friday so it's uh oh. it's pretty interesting one recommendation about the other one and again uh my number one's probably not going to surprise anybody that knows me but anyway um the uh another book that i would recommend you talk about people competing with machines and all that uh curve Vonnegut's first novel is player piano um which is all about and in something that brand and i talk about sometimes the idea of a a post a post-work society um, and what it's, what that's like. And that's what player piano is about, about where basically people aren't really needed for any labor. Um, you know, the machine, the, you have these huge factories that are run by, you know, there, there's like the, the, the manager for the factory and his like underling and they run the entire factory by themselves. And basically everybody else is just kind of doesn't need to work. And so it's kind of an interesting take on that. But uh, Kale, what is your number three? My number three is Ender's Game. Um, you guys already talked about it a little bit. Um, the main reason why I put it on my list, um, as I said, all, all of mine are uh, very much more video-based than, than book-based. Uh, but uh, from my understanding of it is that they're training these kids to, uh, you know, fight in these scenarios or whatever, and then it turns out. Are you going to spoil the? Are you going to spoil the book, Kale? Yeah, 
Are you literally about to spoil the end of the book? It turns out that it's different. It's not it what turns out there was bananas in the sky. It's not what you think. Anyway, that's the thing I liked about it. Well, well, actually, I shouldn't say that I liked. It's the thing that made me go, what? So, yeah, so no, Mike, could, it, could you see that coming? No, I think if you go back to Ender's Game, I think you probably can see it coming to some degree. Um, I, I think you, I don't know about the movie. I haven't seen the movie, but I think in the book you probably can. I mean, I didn't see it. I'm not saying I did see it coming, but it's, it's, it's not, that's not what I, my criteria is. It doesn't have to be, I did see it coming. It's like, if I go back and read the book again, is it conceivable that you could, it's like, it's like a mystery story where right. the killer was Steve from down the street that we introduced, you know, in the last five pages of the book. Yeah, um, I get it. It's a, uh, there, there's right, actually, right. There, there's actually a really funny movie called Murder by Death, which is a, a parody of, of uh, mystery mystery uh, books. Um, and it's about this rich guy who invites a bunch of famous detectives to his house. And they're all like uh, sort of caricatures of famous detectives. So like it's got uh, Peter Falk playing essentially Sam Spade, um, Peter Sellers playing uh another i don't know these detectives it's got like somebody playing agatha christie like all these famous detectives um and uh the rich guy who invites them is is played by uh um truman capote who wrote an actual you know you know uh in cold blood one of very very brutal true crime book uh and one of the things he complains about is these mystery writers that write these stories where they introduce the murder five pages to the end of the book and there's no way you could have ever figured out who it was and i don't like that uh, I get it. Yeah. Uh, okay. So I'm going to my number two and uh, th- this series is just joy. It's just pure joy. And of course it's a Hedgehog's Guide to the Galaxy. Um, everything about that book is perfect and I wouldn't improve a word. Um, I think it, it, what, what Hitchhiker's Guide sort of reminds me of is it is kind of like the Shaun of the Dead of sci-fi, even though it came long before Shaun of the Dead. And the thing is, you can't really do true homage or parody. And I don't know whether I would say Hitchhiker's Guide is parody or homage, maybe somewhere in the middle, um, without really loving the genre. And I think that Douglas Adams really loves the genre of sci-fi. And that's why he's able to write that book in such a way that it is not, it's not making fun of sci-fi, it's having fun with sci-fi. Um, and it's like, there's, there's like laughs on every page, but I think it's very, it's very respectful to the genre. I love all the characters. Uh, I mean, Marvin, the robots, you know, one of the best robots. Um, three times older than the universe. Three times older than the universe. <laughs> Spent like 8 billion years parking cars at the hitchhike, at the restaurant at the end of the universe. Um, so put upon, so put upon. Um and I even like I even like mostly harmless, like even the even the end books when it's not, you know, I think that, you know, I think a lot of people, you know, the original trilogy is the best, you know, the, the first three books. But like even four and five, I loved I love those books. Uh, I loved you know, uh, so long and thanks for all the fish. <laughs> you were talking about the 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 uh, um, the dolphins that are flying. And I was like, did they thank the humans for all the fish? Because they really should. Um, and the Vogons, I mean, the Vogons are great because they're like. I love that the villain, like one of the bigger villain races, isn't even like evil. They're just really, really bureaucratic. <laughs> yeah, very officious. Like, look, they, like they come to destroy Earth, and but they're like, look, we we put the plans up for destroying your planet up in your local, you know, whatever, and you really had a chance to come and and you know say something about that, but you didn't. Um, and I don't know, I just it the, the series is just perfection. I think about that sometimes when I see like new housing developments going up in a developed area. It's like, well, we put the plans up in your local uh, building, you know. Yeah. They were up in the courthouse for five weeks and nobody said anything. What's a, what's a Richard Marcinko's, uh, unless otherwise directed. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Unless otherwise directed. Yeah, uh, all the characters are great. Ford Prefect and, and uh, Arthur Dent are great. Zaphod Beeblebrox is one of the best names of any character ever. Um, it's just, yeah. Just Played a perfect really series. well in the movie by, movie by Sam Rockwell. That's right, he was Sam Rockwell, wasn't he? I totally forgot about that. And uh, who who played Ford and, Prefect was... Uh, uh, 
Most deaf. Most deaf. Most deaf. Yeah. Most deaf. Yeah. Great. Great. And I, I liked uh, Bill Nighy's character in the movie too. Because yeah. Bill Nighy is supposed to be this like he's really dramatic and like he comes on screen very powerful and stuff. But like in the movie, he's like, oh yeah, man. <laughs> like, <laughs> like um, I think actually the only character that has a better name than Zaphod Beeblebrox is Wonko the Sane from Outside the Asylum, which is just another you know, it's a great character name. Um, who decided to build an inside out house so he could be the only person who's living outside the asylum. And he did so because somebody put, uh, what was it? It was uh, uh, instructions on toothpicks, wasn't it? I don't remember. He, he, he went to the grocery store or something and saw that somebody had put, in instru- put instructions on toothpicks and he decided that the entire universe was insane and unsavable. And I think uh, Brandon's favorite part is the what's the race? <laughs> the cricket people. The cricket people who they're, they're they're on a planet that's entirely covered by clouds and one day but it's covered like, by a broken computer they can't see the outside because this computer debris has surrounded their planet they never saw stars okay and then the the, the debris clears they see the stars and they look up and they go well that's gotta go it's <laughs> a great line <laughs> well that's gotta go and so it's like banal reason for being the most evil monsters <laughs> it's just well, like you know. we can't have we can't have other stuff no and by the way i was actually thinking about this week doing uh a uh, pan black pan galactic gargle blaster cocktail uh i think most cocktail channels on youtube have one i have not I, if i'm going to do one i want to do something at least kind of unique um so i will i will do a pan galactic gargle blaster at some point but i want to think about it a little like? bit it's like what is it like having your brain smashed in with a gold brick with a Wrapped twist in... of lemon or something like that and you should never have more than two i think brandon already made that tonight and threw it away didn't you <laughs> <laughs> yes yes should never have one yes the the pan galactic gargle blaster will come at some point but i i want to put some thought into that um yeah anyway anybody have any further thoughts on the greatest or excuse me second greatest uh, well, it, it's it. entered uh, like the common, uh, like even people that haven't read it probably get the the answer forty two right now. I mean, the, it's kind of entered it, and in um, I just suddenly blanked on his name. The author of the book, Douglas Adams. Douglas Adams. His uh uh comparison of a uh uh mud puddle and the 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 water thinking that the hole was made specifically for us for it is one of the best answers to the argument from design for god so i mean on a separate note he also has this other thing that he's famous for that is just really good if you find the video on youtube for that it's worth the watch my my friend don and i when we were in high school would always put sep fields around things yeah. You guys remember the SCP fields? Yeah. Somebody else's problem. Somebody else's problem field. So it's just like a field you can put around things. Well, some where people just be like, I don't care. And so nobody can see it because it's somebody else's problem. Um, yeah. Ugh. So good. All right, Brandon, I'll stop gushing about Hitchhiker's Guide and you can move on to your number two, which is? My number two is a book called This Is How You Lose the Time War. It's by... Emil El Motar and Matt Gladstone. Um, it was made in 2019, I think. Um, it's about these two women. One is called Blue and one is called Red. They are essentially assassins from two separate universes. And they are trying to uh, destroy each other. Um the one side is the gardener and the other side is like the Commonwealth or something like that. I can't remember the exact name, but um, they are agents in this eternal struggle, but they're also time travelers. So they can like go, you know, in the future and in the past and unravel a timeline that, you know, they can undo one thing that unravels a timeline that really helped the other side. And they kind of go back and forth they kind of red and blue kind of discover each other 
and start sending little little notes back and forth at first it's just gloating about haha i undid this thing of yours or i got you there or whatever and then it starts to transition as they start to ask questions of each other it kind of becomes a love story and it becomes almost this capulet and montesquieu uh uh kind of thing you know where it's a, a forbidden love between two factions um and they kind of conspire to uh not not destroy each other's realms because that's just impossible but to get out from underneath each other's realms so they can be together uh the whole book is beautifully written uh it's evocative and uh emotional it's got a lot of um the, the they pass notes through through uh little things that only they can detect like the entrails of a of a bug or, or like a a certain flower will have a uh, pattern on its leaf that if you have the right key can be translated into the note and sometimes they'll leave the note like a hundred years before the flower arrived because they know that that person is going to time jump to this other place and it's it's really really good it's maybe my favorite time travel book. And I, I just finished it like a month and a half ago. Just a couple of factoids. Uh, uh, audible ratings apparently agree with you. It is a 4.3 out of five with over 2000 ratings, which is quite a bit. Uh, and it also won a Hugo, a Nebula. And it's actually pretty short. It's only uh, on audible. It's only about four hours long. So like, that's a yeah, you know, yeah. pretty short. Well, I, I read that. I read it. I didn't, I, I mean, I, I do think audio, audio audio books are reading, but I I read you get it a brain and you read things. You're so smart. I read it on Kindle, so I can't speak to how quick it is. But it is a short book. It is definitely worth your time. I can't. I I bring that up only because I can't speak to the the person reading the book on Audible. But it is definitely worth your time to find it either way. Audible, Kindle, you won't be sorry. It's really really good. It's actually the impetus for uh, this episode it's it's why i wanted to talk about it because i wanted to get this book out there and get people reading it well i definitely want to read it although i will say nothing says romance like leaving the message in the entrails of a book yeah yeah it's it's amazing not only how they do it but there's a, a book uh by henry rollins uh that was written shortly after he saw his best friend kill him or was was killed on his front porch. And there's points on in the book where he is attempting to which one is that? Is that uh, it's like get in the van, is it? See a man die now, see a grown man die now, watch him cry, I think is what it's called. And um there's points where he's trying to explain some of his feelings, and all he can do is just the best he can. Like there's one point, like somebody comes up to him and says, like, I hope you're how, like, how are you doing? I hope you're having a good day or something. He goes, I wish I could just take my lungs out and hand it to them and walk away. It's, it's a feeling that can't be conveyed by normal ideas. And that's what happens a lot in uh, this is how you lose the time war. There's this feeling that the letters that the letters to each other gives to them that is very visceral and they, they can't really describe it in, in normal terms. It's it's part of the book's appeal, I think. Sounds like love. It is. Well, I currently have four credits on uh, Audible, so I can see what one will go to. Uh, Jim, I believe we are to your number two. All right, number two is a 2009 novel from China Miaville. I don't know how to say his last name. Um, the city... You're just going to say from China. Except he's not. I think he's... Uh, British, Welsh, I don't know. Uh, the title of the book right. is The City and the City. And it's a murder mystery. And it's set in a uh, kind of futuristic, not very futuristic, um, Cold War setting, uh, like East and West Berlin, except uh the cities are intertwined and um i don't think i'm giving too much of the plot of the book away uh, it takes you a while to realize it 
but the cities actually aren't separate. It's like 1984 where it's a, like a thought crime to perceive the other city because you're not in, you have to be in the city that you're in. You can't be in the other city, even though it could be like right across the street. Um, and uh, so the main character is a detective. He's got a murder mystery. There's a secret society involved. Um, there's a lot of kind of Cold War spy stuff going on because he has to, you know, uh, immigrate to the other city to try and solve the murder. Um, it's a just very, very unique book. Someone really tried to get me to read Perdido Street uh, Station. I think it's called once, and I never got around to it. I, I, I don't have an opinion on China Melville. I, I don't know how good is he. So I love City in the City. Obviously, otherwise it wouldn't be on the list. I liked Perdido Street Station a lot. I've had a hard time with some of his other books, like Kraken. I just couldn't get into. Um, so I feel like he's. A little spotty for me and i have not read a lot i've just probably only finished those two and i tried reading kraken and maybe another one um, for DDC so station is very long yeah um, um quite long. there's a lot of stuff that happens in the book though it's not uh it doesn't really drag there's just a lot of stuff going on and uh that one is very much um it's kind of a sci-fi steampunk magic all combined into one big thing it's uh it's bizarre hmm. but worth reading yeah, yeah i toast that in my cart too Perdido really or the city city uh the city in the city that one to me sounds kind of more interesting i guess um i think i've read embassy town too and that's good just not as good as the other two. Um, Kale, number two. What do you got? My number two is a book that was written in the 60s. And a lot of other books and movies and stuff are based on it. You may have heard of it. It's called Dune. Uh, yeah. I put it as number two because... Um, well, it, the only reason it's not number one is because my number one is your number one bit, has a little bit more spread to it. Um, but uh, Dune clearly, I mean, it's a pillar when it, when you talk about sci-fi. Uh, it's it's like part of the foundation of sci-fi. I like what and, you do there. Uh, and uh, just it's a really great book made a really great movie um made a couple of bad movies wrong which... <laughs> i think going another, forward anytime we do any kind of a list no one is no one is allowed to do it on the list i feel Best like none of, us have, movies. none of us it's have anything wrong. to say it's about doom it, it covers all the bases. It's it's like if you've seen a sci-fi movie, you've seen Dune. That's... See, there's this guy. He's got a family. They moved to the desert. There's a bunch of conflict. That's all I know. Here. Um, all right. Uh, I'm going to go into honorable mentions. Um, Dune was an honorable mention because I didn't want to talk about it anymore. It's the best book I've read that I don't want to say a damn thing about. <laughs> Somebody comes up and asks me what I think about Dune and be like, it's great. Now, fuck off. You know, punch him in the head. Uh, so Intoxicated one masculinity. Is, um, one of the ones is one that I think probably is not meant for uh, people of our particular gender. Um, I think it's, it's sort of more meant for a female audience, a younger audience. What's that um, supposed to mean? It's we're old white guys. Some of us even older than others. So we shouldn't even try. Um, it's on a bunch of Hunger Games. I think the Hunger Games is really good. It's got a good message behind it, and the characters are pretty interesting. Uh, definitely didn't make my top five. 
Um, but it doesn't need to make my top five. It's still, it's, you know, top, an honorable mention is a good book. Um, and I think they're good. They're, they're breezy. You know, you can get through the whole series pretty quickly. There's what, is it three books, I think, or four? I think it's three. No, it's definitely three because there's four movies because they did that Harry Potter BS thing where they separated the last book into two books needlessly. Yep. Um, uh, God, who liked Harry Potter and the Deathly Hollows part one? Nobody. It was awful. It was just people wandering around aimlessly. It's like, hey, let's take the boringest part of this book and make a whole movie out of that. And then we'll make another, put all the exciting stuff in the other one. Yes. Ugh, I, such a terrible idea. It should have so just not was made that the book over it. The What's first that? movie is the first 500 pages of the last book. I didn't like the first 500 pages of the last book either. I wouldn't have <laughs> Maybe they could cut it down. Movie, I'm like, I hope they cut this part out because it's boring. Um, so the no, other one is that. Annihilation, uh, which is a movie. I, so I read the book before I watched the movie, like right before, because I saw it was coming out. Um, and that is such a weird freaking book and a weird freaking movie. It's, that um, I love. Jeff Vandermeer, is that his name? Oh, I'll have to look it up to tell you. Um, uh, movie's got a great cast. And like the bear in the movie is one of the scariest things you'll see in any horror movie. Um, that bear is terrifying. You see a giant like bloody bear that screams and also has like a lady voice screaming underneath it. It's just, it's horrifying. Um, uh, no, it's really good. It's very, the, the ending is very odd and kind of difficult to, unwrap i guess i don't know did you guys read the book or watch the movie yes i didn't read i didn't watch the movie you read I the book the movie. jim did you read the book as well or just watch the movie i've not who's the author oh god i think it's jeff vandermeer now i'm gonna say it's not jeff vandermeer what about that of course you want vamp while i look things up vamp is that like scat no baron you're wrong it was jeff vandermeer so i stand corrected um yeah i don't know it's just it's a, it's a very very strange book i don't know what i got out of it to be honest i think it is so one thing that i think is important is i think it's lovecraftian have, yeah i don't know it's not not lovecraftian that's for sure um yeah. I think some people feel that you have to walk out of a movie understanding the message of the movie immediately, or it was a waste of time. And I don't think that's the case. I think oftentimes the movies that I like best, I didn't understand right away. And I had to kind of look up what other people said about them and what other people were saying for it to get it to make sense. And that's kind of the way I felt about Annihilation is it's, it's about sort of the nature of memory and existence. And it's, it's just, it's a very complicated movie and, and book. Um, and I thought the, the, the book, the movie was a very, very good adaptation of it. Uh, it's gorgeous, gorgeously shot. Um, and yeah, I know. I just, I, I felt like I walked away from it asking myself questions and, and thinking about it. And I, you know, watched a bunch of videos about it, which I don't think I did with, I don't do with most movies that I watch. Um, so I think on that level, it was definitely a success. Uh, Joe, Jim, what did you think of that movie? Do you like it or not like it or? Um, I did like it. I felt like I needed to rewatch it, and then I never did. Yeah. So, like, I liked it, but didn't love it. Um, before we move on uh, with Brian's honorable mentions, I just want to add two other notes of things I wanted to bring up. I feel bad. I've never read a Ray Bradbury book. Are you? How was that even possible? I know. Like, with, I, with your other tastes, I I find. I know. That I know. I mean, how have I not read Fahrenheit four, Fahrenheit four fifty one? It's it seems like it should not be possible. It's really good. Uh, I'm sure it is. I'm. I have nothing against Ray, Bad, Ray, Ray, Ray Bradbury, um, but I just, I, for whatever reason, I just never got around to reading Ray Bradbury. And he's you know, great. I think I with assume. Fahrenheit four, with Fahrenheit four fifty one, you should definitely not read the book. You should just gather in this virtual space with your friends and talk about it, and never, never, ever read a book. That's true. I'll go get the fireman. Uh, and the other thing I wanted to mention is that I hate Ernest Klein. Um, that is Ready Player One and Armada. Uh, and I feel like he's a fake writer. I, I don't think he's like, I mean, I understand he's a writer, but I don't feel like he has had a single uh, unique thought in, I mean, the two books that I've read, maybe I don't think he's written any more after that, has he? Um. 
like there's Here's no a vamp there's, for you. There's nothing there's nothing unique about anything he has ever written down. And it is amazing to me. I was wrong on a previous episode. I have not read Artemis. It was Hail Mary I was thinking of. Okay. Artemis um, is the one on the moon, right? I have not read Artemis. I don't know. Okay. So I think I did, and I didn't really care for it. So I was wrong. He's written Ready Player One, Armada, and now Ready Player Two, because just going on with the incredibly unique uh, thought process that he puts into his writing style. And like, it's funny. The first time I read Ready Player One, I kind of liked it until I started thinking about it at all. And it's just such pablum. It's just such absolutely nothing, like spitting back all the things you know from your childhood with no substance or anything. It's just so icky uh, i don't know Did, have you guys read uh, ernest klein i read ready player one i thought it was um entertaining as a young adult fiction book that didn't really have anything to say about anything yeah, armada is armada is so the last starfighter that i'm almost surprised nobody sued them like it seems like it's just the last starfighter i mean it's about a kid who plays a game and the game is secretly a test to see if he can fly a starship to defend the Earth against, you know, aliens or whatever. And it's just like, so maybe, just wrote, maybe there's a, maybe there's a little bit of uh, Ender's game sprinkled in. Maybe, maybe a little, but it's 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 just it's the last starfighter. <laughs> like he just wrote down the last starfighter and changed the names. I'm like, it's kind of incredible. So I don't know. Uh, my last complaints about that, uh, Brandon. Do you have any honorable mentions or anything to say about Ernest Klein? Because he's a hack. <laughs> <laughs> Not about Ernest Klein, no. Um, as far as an honorable mention go, there is a book. It's a uh, it's a anthology of some of the more influential short stories in sci fi. It's put together by Orson Scott Card, but it's called uh, Masterpieces. It features uh, William Gibson, Asimov, uh, George R. R. Martin, Ursula K. Le Guin, a whole host of others. It's it's pretty good. Arthur C. Clarke's the way, in there. We'll try and uh, I'm going to try to put the links to these. I, I don't know if we're going to do Audible links or Amazon links or some something else. We'll try to put some links to these things in the in the comments uh, below or in the, not in the comments, the description. Sorry, uh, Jim. What honorable mentions do you have? Uh, I have a few. Um, one for you, Ray Bradbury. Uh, if you picked <laughs> up any of his, for you, I would recommend The Illustrated Man. Um, okay. It's essentially a book of short stories wrapped around you know a, a narrative of the illustrated man um and it's basically kind of twilight zone short stories um it's uh it i think it's ray bradbury does creepy pretty well um the next one for ray bradbury that you should try out is something wicked this way comes not a science fiction book but creepy and good i i watched the movie uh, which is, I saw that it's, it's, uh, oh God, what's his name? Uh, real famous character actor, uh, starred in it. Um, <laughs> holy cow, scared the hell out of me. Um, it, it's, uh, I'll think about it later. Anyway, uh, no, I've seen them, I saw the movie when I was a kid because they played that movie like a million times on, on, uh, TV. Um, uh, you know, I don't think I've ever seen it. Um, well, it was, it, when you talk about your next honorable mention, move on to kill. I'll, I'll tell you who's in it. It's, it's a real famous character actor, and I just can't think of his name right now. All right. So I've got a, a couple more. Uh, Philip K. Dick, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? Um, I think Philip K. Dick writes interesting books. I don't think they're particularly super well written and entertaining, but they're thoughtful. Um, and by the way, we may be doing uh, Androids Dream of, Dream of Electric Sheep. Uh, in a year or so, when the sequel to Dune comes out, we have some plans about that. But I have heard uh, of that one. Um, so that one. another it's Blade Runner. Yeah, it's Blade two, Runner. Two more authors that almost made my list are Ian M. Banks and Alistair Reynolds. Um, I think Ian M. Banks writes a more readable book than Alistair Reynolds, but they both write um, very good modern space opera books. Um, probably the my entire. Best. Uh, 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 what's the culture series culture is series. kind of so, anarchistic. So my, yeah, my favorite uh, culture series book is uh, probably Player of Games or Use of Weapons. I'm not a huge fan of Consider Felbus, which is kind of his most famous book in that. It's kind of um, the first one, and it's the one I have read, and that yeah, that one's 
not great. So, so the you should try the other two that I suggested: player of games and use of weapons. They're much more uh, entertaining. Okay. Um, also, uh, not culture book by him that I really liked is Transition. Um, it's kind of about the, an agency that tries to uh, um, protect the flow of time, except maybe they're not really doing that. Um, and then with Alistair Reynolds, his books are uh, a little bit more challenging to read. Um, they're not quite as entertaining. One of my favorite books of his is um, Terminal World, and it's a, it's a standalone book. Most of Alistair Reynolds' other books are uh, set in the Revelation space universe, um, but Terminal World is not. It's a lot easier to get in and out of, and it's a, it's a pretty entertaining read. Uh, by the way, the movie uh, was starring Jason Robarbs, that's the name I couldn't think of. It also had uh, Jonathan Price, Diane Ladd, and of all people, Pam Greer. So, yeah, <laughs> I think I watched that movie at least a couple of a couple of few times when I was a kid uh, because they played it on on TV a lot. But I don't remember that much about it. Um, Kale, what are your honorable mentions? Well, I, I only have one, and that's because I changed my number five. Uh, and the reason that I put it at my, as an honorable mention is because when I first started looking up, you know, like what are the top sci-fi books and like what are popular sci-fi books and stuff. And this was, if not the first, it was one of the first ones on almost every site that I looked at and it's called The Singularity. Uh, I haven't read it, but I just, I looked at a review of it. It's something that interests me. We've mentioned it before in, in other uh, books that we talked about uh, where AI becomes basically more intelligent than human intelligence and uh, what all that entails and, and where that's going to take us. And that looks like an interesting book to me. So if there's a book out there that's just solely about that subject, it's something that I think people should look into. And who's the author? Um, couldn't tell you. I didn't look that far into it. Well, we'll put it. We'll put a, a thing in the thing. thing I should have brought up as an honorable mention Dan Simmons' uh, Hyperion. It's very good. It's. Uh, people are on a spaceship on a long journey, and they all kind of tell their stories about how they got there. Um, so I'm going to go with my number one and absolutely just shock people by having it be a Kurt Vonnegut book um, because Kurt Vonnegut's my favorite writer of all time. I've read all of his books multiple times um, and uh, I was sort of struck with which one to go with. I, I sort of my initial reaction was to do Sirens of Titan because Sirens of Titan is a great book, but it's not my favorite Kurt Vonnegut book. Um, uh, I didn't want to do any of his books that were sort of on the fence of being sci-fi or not sci-fi i wanted to get one that was definitely a science fiction book uh and so i went with cat's cradle um because cat's cradle is if not my favorite Kurt Vonnegut book among them um it's about it's funny it's it's sort of like a lot of Kurt Vonnegut books what it's about isn't what it's really about it's sort of like the least important thing um it's about a guy who is a, a scientist um who helped develop the atomic bomb and then he dies and so there's a guy that's interviewing his family it's basically just all an excuse to get them to this island um, and to have all these people sort of interact. And it's the uh, um, the the scientist's older son who is sort of the has sort of become the monarch of the island um, and his younger brother and I think their sister and just the way they all interact with one another. And, and um, it's where they start off with uh, where, where he invents Bokanonism. I don't know. Does anybody know Bokanonism? Um, I've heard you talk about it. It's the religion they invent specifically for the book. And it's sort of this very, very humanistic kind of religion. Uh, people uh, commune by touching feet. Um, and uh, uh, my favorite, one of my favorite quotes from the book is uh, Newt, who is the um, kid. And I just could not ever stop picturing uh, um, the other played Tyrion Lannister in uh, Game of Thrones. Peter Dinklage. Peter Dinklage. I just, I could not stop picturing Peter Dinklage in this role. I think he'd be so perfect for it uh, because Newt is this incredibly like jaded uh, person. Um, and so 
the, the thrust of the book, and I'm not describing it very well, I'm, I know, because it's a, a lot of the things that the book is about is a little bit more visceral and not, not so clearly stated, but it's kind of about the innate ridiculousness of the human condition. Um, hence Bokunanism. Uh, in one, uh, they get to talking about these kids games and one of them is cat's cradles. The cat's cradles, you get the, you know, the little strings around your fingers and you put it in a certain way and that's a cat's cradle. And one of the things Newt will always do is hold up his hands in the shape of a cat's cradle and say, see the cat, see the cradle. And what he's saying is there's this thing that we've called a cat's cradle that clearly is not a cat or a cradle. It has nothing to do with either. Um, and it's it's just this this sort of this embrace of humanity's ridiculousness. Um, uh, I, I should say also the the book involves the apocalypse. Um, uh, ice nine is is this uh, new form of ice that they created that, that the the father the, the grandfather father created to help troops in World War II. I know I'm really all over the place on this one. <laughs> I'm trying to describe this book in a way that makes sense, but it's so like kind of all over the place. Um, but my my favorite one is, so throughout the book, you have these sayings of Bokanon, who's Bokanon is the one that started the Bokanonist religion. Um, and he sort of describes life and his description of life is that we are all mud that got to sit up and look around for a little while before falling back down to the ground and becoming mud again. And I thought that was just a great description of what humanity is like. It's like, you know, everybody does all these things to try to preserve their legacy or to, to make their mark on society or to do all these things. When in actuality, all we are is we're just little bits of the earth that got to be sentient for a while and kind of walk around and look around and see the world. And then, you know, we collapse back down and become part of the earth again. Um, and it's just it's a it's just a great book. It's it's really funny, too. Like it's I'm sort of almost making it sound more serious than I should. But it's it's very there, funny. It's a very funny. There book. are real life tribes that that do the feet touching thing as a communal thing. It doesn't surprise me. I, mean, to, to, I, th I think I think Bokanism has actually caught on with small groups of people. Um, and uh, I mean, it, it Bokan on himself is an avowed liar. <laughs> the person who started the religion. Uh, I don't know. It's just it's a fantastic book. And I think he, it's it's impossible to describe in a way that makes any sense because the movie, it, the, the book kind of doesn't make sense, but it doesn't make sense in a really beautiful way. And it's Kurt Vonnegut. So he writes Kurt Vonnegut writes the way my mind works. So it's like when I read Kurt Vonnegut, I feel like I'm reading something out of my own head. It's just, I don't know. I love his stuff. And I'll stop gushing about Cat's Cradle. I'm assuming nobody else has read Cat's Cradle. I have not. I haven't. I have it, but I haven't read it. Have you guys read any other Vonnegut? I've read Slaughterhouse. That's a Slaughterhouse and the monkey one, the short story one. Welcome to the monkey house. I, I tried to start. Uh, um, I don't know. You mentioned it earlier. Sirens. Sirens of Titan. Yeah, I just I couldn't get into that one. Well, I mean, Vonnegut has a very unique writing style, and it is not a traditional sci-fi writing style. Um, For sure. I mean, I, I really other, like. I really like Slaughterhouse Five. And Slaughterhouse good. Five has some great things to do. It's, I mean, it's uh, honestly just the intro where he's talking about it. You know. Um, my, my favorite quote there, he said he's talking to a friend of his about writing a book about World War II because Kurt Vonnegut was in World War II. He was in a, in a uh, prisoner of war camp um, in Dresden. Um, and Dresden was some of the most, you know, brutal bombing that was done during the entire war. Uh, I mean, to rival the firebombing of, of Tokyo. Um, and he's talking to a friend is about writing this book. And he says, uh, I, I'm going to write a book about, you know, war. Uh, and the guy asked him if it's going to be a pro-war book or an anti-war book. And he says it's going to be an anti-war book. And the friend says, why not write an anti-glacier book? And the, the uh, meaning obviously being, why write a book about something for which you can do absolutely nothing to stop and is going to continue doing exactly what it's doing no matter what you do? Um, yeah, I love Vonnegut. And I'll stop gushing about him. Brandon, what is your number one? My number one is... Exhalation by Ted Chang. He's written two books that are both short stories. The other one could also be mentioned as a great book. It's the one that has um, uh, Arrival. The, it's the short story that the movie was based off. <clears throat> but I chose Exhalation uh, specifically for the, the short story that is the, the, the title story. Um, it is this reframing of the second law of thermodynamics and entropy 
and it is so good. Um, the rest of the stories in there are also fantastic. Uh, Ted Chang is very good sci-fi writing, but in Exhalation, there's this, it's, it's an alien species. He, uh, they're kind of clockwork. Like he can, using mirrors, he can take apart the back of his head and study his own brain. And uh, he figures out that they use this compressed air to uh, move all the little like windmills and stuff in his brain. And he kind of figures out that this must be running down, that this every time the compressed air gets uncompressed, that it's just this only a certain amount of times left that this can happen. It's it's really good. I'm not smart enough to understand it the first time. I'm going to have to go back through it the second time. But the it's the closest I have ever come almost epiphany like to under truly understanding the basic idea of entropy. It, it's really good. That's cool. Apologies about my camera. We're back though. Um, Jim, have you read that one? I have not read that one. I, uh, I have a dirty little secret to confess. I don't like short stories. I actually do. I just have a hard time getting over the hump of starting a book. And I feel like by the time the short story is over, I want more and there's no more. So I actually prefer series just because I have a hard time starting books. I, I do understand that feeling. I would say fight it for this one. Try, try the Ted Chang books. All right. One of my first classes at community college was short stories. <laughs> I feel like short stories are something that some people love and some people really, really hate. Um, just kind of the form. And I get it. Um, I'm I mean, kind of, I, I, I guess I say there's two people and I, I'm kind of on the fence. I, I get it. And I, I, I don't know. I don't know if I love them or not. I, I love some short stories. Certainly. Um, I like to be able the idea of being able to get a whole narrative out in a relatively quick amount of time. Right. Um, I don't know. I guess the one thing, and this is something I think, that I think streaming services have kind of taught us, is that a thing should be as long as it needs to be. You know, if a movie needs to be, and by the way, so I've been watching a lot of horror lately, and so I've been watching a lot of movies that are, you know, 78 minutes, like 78 to 89 minutes, which is great, you know, uh, length for a movie. Um, but if a movie needs to be longer, that's fine, just so long as it needs to be that length. And it's sort of the same thing with a story. I mean, some stories need to be 12 pages and some stories need to be, you know, 10,000 pages. Um, and I think as long as they're doing what they need to be, then that's fine with me. I read something interesting about that just today about Disney and how Disney learned a lot from what Netflix did with the Marvel series. And after, you know, reviewing what Netflix has done, they decided that they were not going to do a every season is going to be 13 episodes. The episodes are going to be so long. They are just going to create a story and they are going to make the episodes as long as they need to be and have as many episodes as they need to have. And they don't need to be uniform length. They don't have the series don't have to all be approximately the same number of episodes. We'll just tell the story. And when we're done, we're done. And, yeah, that's uh, one of those that's one of those things that I noticed watching those Netflix Marvel shows is even the ones that I really like Jessica Jones, I think it's probably the season one, not season two. Oh, season two is bad. Um, season one, even though that's a that's a great story with a great main character, a great villain, maybe the greatest villain. I, I think Purple Man is just perfect in that show. Um, but it's still like there's like two or three episodes where you're like, we didn't really need that. Um, right. And I mean, like I remember watching trying to show Vanessa Smallville. Um, and trying to watch a season of Smallville is hard because there's like 24 episodes and so much of that is just nothing. It's just nothing you need. It's just like, I don't, I don't want any of this. Like, just give me to the actual important story things. Like, give me, give me more, you know, Michael Rosenbaum is Lex Luthor and, you know, let's move on and it makes not me think about think, what happened to Chloe. It makes me think of, I used to watch Supernatural. <laughs> there's there's a million episodes of supernatural I know. I think. there's like 16 seasons and every season has like 18 episodes and every episode is like an hour long 
it's just crazy. You could, you could sit there and watch it and be like, where did the last 10 years of my life go? It is just so too much. Just so too much. Like I watched, I rewatched community for like the 10 millionth time recently. And like, you can watch all six seasons. Like they're, they're 25 minute episodes, except for the last season where they, they can move around a little bit. Um, and there's, you know, there's, there's a fair number of episodes, but they're fairly quick and breezy. And I don't know, just the idea of watching, you know, I mean, how many seasons of, of supernatural are there to be? As they should be. Anyway, I'm sorry. I'm going to stop. Uh, uh, Jim, what is your, what is your number one? Uh, my number one is a 2014 book by Anne Leckie. And that's my uh, picture. It's Ancillary Justice. It's the first book of a, a trilogy called the Imperial Ratch Trilogy. Um, the Ratch is the um, empire that the story is set around. And there's two main characters in the series and they both, um, one is an artificial intelligence, one is a human, and they both have multiple, um, multiple bodies associated with them, essentially. So the artificial intelligence has multiple people and the human has multiple people. And um, over the course of this early part of the story, setting up the conflict, um, the artificial intelligence gets reduced to one person. And it's very unnatural for the artificial intelligence. Uh, it's very hard on the artificial intelligence. And the human um, splinters into multiple personalities. So the human can't handle being so many disparate people with so many disparate experiences over decades and centuries and uh, starts fighting. The, the human character starts uh, having a civil war. And uh, so that's, that's kind of the setup of the series. I just, um, I thought the characters were very well developed. The, uh, um, the great motivation moving the characters. That's a interesting societal setup. It's a you know, kind of um, I'm drawing a blank. Um, very formal society. Uh, let's put it that way. And uh, um, the galactic civilization has a lot of different societies. And the, the I think the author does a very good job of giving you the flavor without over explaining everything. And that's something I really appreciate in the author. Brandon kind of brought it up earlier with um, Neil Stevenson. Uh, sometimes he does not know how to give you flavor with brevity. Um, and that that's something that I really appreciate about Anne Leckie's books. I've not finished the trilogy, but I've read a prequel in the first two books. And uh, so far I've liked all the, all the books. I read I read primarily nonfiction, and there are a lot of nonfiction writers that are just impossible to read. There's one uh, a guy I don't want to mention him because I don't want to call him out, but he he wrote a book that was really interesting. That was sort of about the the relationship between religion and political power in the United States, which to me is like an incredibly interesting thing to think about. Um, and it is the most dead, dull, boring book you can ever imagine. Like it's so dry. It's like you just need to stop reading and take a drink of water. It's so dry. Um, and it's like it, it, it's infuriating to me when somebody takes a really interesting concept and just makes it boring and it's frustrating. So it's it's nice to people that can give things color and give them kind of, you know, a, a sense of um, a sense of uh, like visceralness. Um, and and right. I appreciate that a lot. Brent, did you have anything to say? You, you said you haven't read that one, right? No, but it's it's been kind of on my list and I was sampling it on my last uh, go round of uh, uh, Audible credits. So I put it on my wish list there. Well, it's in my cart, so I'm one ahead of you. Fantastic. All right, Kale, what is your what is your number one? 
Uh, my number one is Alien. And that's just because it's like the Hulk Hogan of sci-fi. It's kind of everywhere in all pop culture. It's it's crossed every genre, I think. It's a book. It's a movie. It's it's a meme. It's it's a cartoon. It's it's everywhere. Like, uh, like I say it's the Hulk Hogan of sci-fi because everybody's heard of Hulk Hogan and everybody's heard of Alien. That's the one about the alien, right? Yeah, well, I mean, it's kind of like, you know how Dune, like, is kind of like the, that's like the base for everything, and then Aliens, like, it's, it's the, the whipped cream on top, basically, it's like, yay, I, I don't well, know what else to say about it, like, it's everywhere, it's every, they're everywhere, they're all around us. They actually are. Um, now, I watched Alien when I was very, very young and YMCA, which I think I mentioned on a couple weeks ago, um, at an age where I probably should have been watching Alien because I was very, very young. And that movie is very, very adult. There's a lot of people that get their heads smashed in and there's like androids without heads that are still running around like punching at people. Um, actually, so of my, my getting into comic books, the first thing I got into was Aliens. Um, specifically the aliens versus predator, which to me was like, it was sort of eye opening because, you know, if, if you're a kid in the, in the seventies, eighties, whatever, it's like, you could watch your movie and it's like, okay, that's the movie you watch that movie and everything kind of stays in its own little box, you know? Um, and the first time I saw a comic book where it was like aliens versus predator. And I was like, that's the coolest thing that could ever happen. It's like Hogan <laughs> versus the ultimate warrior. Because like it's it's the predator from the Arnold Schwarzenegger movie Predator, and the alien from the Alien and Aliens movies, and somebody did a comic book where they punch each other. How could anything be better than that? Um, by the way, uh, there can be things better than that. <laughs> Having looking back on it now, it wasn't as good as it could have been. But the Alien movies are great. I mean, it's just you know. I, I, I actually have a really weak spot for Alien 3. I know I know everybody kind of hates that movie, and I think it has a lot of charm, uh, especially been, if you watch the producer's cut. You've embarrassingly mentioned this a few times before. Alien 3 is a good movie, or it's almost a good movie. It's adjacent to a good movie. Why do you like it? Because I like all the characters. The characters in Alien 3 are all really interesting and cool. Like, it's got Charles Dance, Charles S. Dutton. Uh, I mean, it's, it's got all these really interesting characters, and I like all of them. And uh, uh, yeah, there's problems. Uh, I, I think it is kind of messed up. They kill off uh, Newton Hicks off screen when they were like the main characters of the previous movie. Um, but just as a movie by itself, I think it's I think it's pretty good. I actually like it better than Aliens. <laughs> Hush you. It is very uh, encapsulated. It's it feels very claustrophobic. Plus, I mean, and this is something we could, I don't know, we could probably do a whole episode about Alien and Aliens, but uh, I feel like Cameron, so Aliens is a, is a fun movie. It's got a lot of really good actors doing a lot of fun stuff, but it is nothing like Alien. It is a completely different movie from Alien. Um, there are completely different sensibilities. I mean, Aliens is not even really a horror movie exactly. It's kind of a horror, but it's more of an action movie. Um, and I feel like Alien 3 brings it back, brings the, the franchise back to its roots as being like a space horror movie. And Brandon definitely disagrees with me on that. I I, I was bored by Alien Three. I I was glad when it was over. You would be. Are you guys um, gonna punch each other now? Yes. Everybody has to agree with my opinions because if you don't agree with my opinions, then we have to. I'm fight. gonna write a comic and I'm gonna call it Mike versus Brandon arguing about movies. It will not be as good as Alien versus Predator. Um. <laughs> Yeah, uh, so I think we've talked a lot about our favorite science fiction books, um, and I think we all like sci-fi, and I think that we probably have a lot more things we've read or watched that, that we like a lot, but you know, uh, if it takes us two hours to talk about five each, then we can't really do top ten, because we'll be here all night, and right. some people need to get to bed. Um, Brandon, do you have any uh, final thoughts on uh, science fiction books? Any final recommendations, anything like that? No, I, I think if you added all these books to your uh audible or kindle library i think you'd be pretty happy jim um i love reading science fiction i think it's one of the best um genres for exploring difficult concepts and uh kind of taking present day emotion and all the baggage out of it 
Um, so uh, I think there's a ton of really good science fiction that's been written over the last couple of decades. Um, the older stuff is really good too, but uh, a lot of really good stuff is being written. Sounds good. Uh, Kale. Well, I, I think we talked about a few interesting things. Uh, I learned a couple of things, and I hope the people watching this learned a couple of things. Um, one of the things I did pick up that kind of spurred in my head, and I want to share it with everyone, uh, don't try to build a legacy. Try to build a better world. That's what I got out of this. Fair enough. Um, and uh, you'll, you'll look forward to the new series where we just do uh, episodes of me unsuccessfully trying to explain Kurt Vonnegut books to the rest of the of the people here. Um, and I'm so excited that I can't explain them at all and sound like a lunatic. And I think everybody will enjoy that. Uh, so always I think remember. Kurt Vonnegut would appreciate that. Oh, he would love that. He would love people sure. badly explaining his books. <laughs> and anybody who rips out the last starfighter can fight me. Yes. Um, see the cat, see the cradle. All right. I want to thank everybody for watching. Please like, share, subscribe, and have a good drink and have a good day. Goodbye, everybody. Yeah, everybody. I never wanted to be a scientist anyway. <laughs> <laughs>